Hope a lot of you starting the new year have joined Planet Fitness <clears throat> or other ones, you know, Lifetime or LA Fitness or any of those. I think they're all great. And Timothy said that physical training does do some good. Oh, we, we like to skip that verse in the Bible. <laughs> We're all spiritual. You know? Physical training is of some value. But then he follows it up with this, right? He says, but eternal training lasts forever. And so spiritual matters so much, so much more. The sermon this morning is titled, Building 429 Needs Elevators. And I'll explain what that's about here in a few minutes. But in this message, uh, we're continuing. It's part three. We'll end it next week, the fourth part. I hope you will be here. Uh, we've been focusing on one scripture, and that is Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. And it reads like this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Hear it. Hear the way it's intended, but you will receive power. Why do I say it with that voice inflection? Because they've just been asking him, Lord, are you going to establish your kingdom? Is this it? Are you going to overthrow Rome? Are you going to let us be part of your kingdom, your right hand man? Do we get to experience the authority slash power that we've been talking about? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or dates. Don't worry about that stuff. But then he says, but... You will receive authority slash power when? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you, very important word, and you, plural you, and y'all, and you guys, <laughs> you will be my planet witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. These are the words of Christ to us. And so what I'm trying to do in this four-part series is focus on the four main points. They're all found in this, this verse. You, your Jerusalem, your Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of your earth. That's what we're called to Pastor Adam, when he was uh, leading the song earlier, talked about the gospel, the good news. Getting the good news to all parts of this planet as fast as possible. That's what we're all about. First week we talked about euangelion. It's the Greek word for gospel, you. The goal is to get you filled with the Spirit of God. And when, when that happens, it is life transforming. And then uh, last week was... GPS, Global Positioning System. And it, I gave this imagery. It's like when you're driving down the highway and you realize you're looking at your GPS and then you see the lane next to you. They've got their GPS. And then that guy up there, he has GPS. And, and all are receiving signals from a main bank. But all are going in different directions. I'm going to take a left. That guy's going to go straight. The other one's going right. That's how it is with God. With us, he orders and directs our lives and he leads us. And, and that is really the system that's in place when we're filled with the Spirit. And I, I asked you um, this question in the book of Acts. How did they act? And that's really what this series is about. In other words, here in the 21st century, we would do well to act like they acted in the book of Acts. And if we can do that, then here's, here's what they did. All of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. They shared meals together. They had communion. They prayed. This is Acts chapter 2 at the end of the chapter. It's, uh, a deep sense of awe came over all of them. Uh, all the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And the believers met together in one place. They shared everything they had. This is how they acted. Uh, they sold their property, their possessions. They shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met at homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared meals with great joy and generosity. All the while they were praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Have you been noticing that the Lord is adding to our fellowship each Sunday when we gather? Isn't that exciting? I want to tell you something. We've got an amazing month of April planned. You, you, you will hear all about it next Sunday. 
But three weeks in a row, we're believing God's going to pack this place out. April 7th is Whiteout Sunday. That's the same weekend as uh, NCAA basketball Final Four weekend. White t-shirt over every chair that says, Though my sins are as scarlet, I am white as snow. We're inviting our friends. Everybody gets a free shirt. Wouldn't you want a free shirt if you could get a free shirt? April 14th, we have Power for... Power for Life Ministries. I started to say the wrong name. They used to be Power Team. These are bodybuilding guys, hulking strong muscle men that break, you know, bricks and lumber and, and blow up hot air bottles, uh, water bottles. And, and uh, I mean, they do all kinds of amazing feats and they're going to be with us four nights in a row. They'll be doing school assemblies April 8, 9, and 10. And each of those evenings, they will be inviting them to come to our church and inviting families to come and experience the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And, and then on April 21st, that's Easter Sunday. Those three Sundays in a row. On that day, we're going to have at least two services. And we're going to have more chairs in here than we do now. And we're believing God for a miracle. I've been asking Him to double our, our church, God. double it in a Sunday. I believe He can do that. And I want you to be praying with us that we can have significant impact upon the city of Buckeye. Now, um, Building 429 needs elevators. What, Keith, what in the world is that about? Well, it was November 19th, 2018, just a few months ago. Uh, the John Hancock Center, one of the most famous buildings in Chicago, up on the 95th floor there, they have this world famous restaurant and it's called the Signature Room. And I suspect it's because at the end of your meal they bring you a little bill and you give them your card and you sign your life away. I don't know why they, they call it the signature room, but it's a very swank tank restaurant. Six people had just finished this amazing meal and they got on the elevator 95 floors up. And as they started going down, something went horribly wrong and it was going way faster than normal and they heard crack, 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 crack. And suddenly it starts falling and it's hitting the walls going down. It's going past every floor, getting faster and faster, almost into a free fall. There were six people on the elevator. One was a pregnant lady. Two of them was, uh, were law students at the local university. Two of them were a couple who was visiting our country from Mexico. Uh, their names are Jaime and Mene. And they immediately began to pray on a falling elevator. <clears throat> it fell 84 floors. Wow. <laughs> and then it jammed up in a, um, a block, blackened, black, blocked off area that they couldn't even get to in between the 10th and 11th floor. They got stuck right there. Miraculously, Nobody died. Miraculously, people walked away three and a half hours later when they were set free. Um, what had happened, the hoist ropes, they call them, they're actually cables. The two main cables, there's several other cables, but the two main ones snapped. It had just passed inspection, too, a, a short while earlier, but what an amazing, amazing thing. Um, there is a Christian band called Building 429. They get their name from the verse in Ephesians, Ephesians 429, which says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is good for building others up Amen. according to their need. Uh, you know, Jesus said that uh, he would build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, building 429, I'm using that as a metaphor for this message. Let building 429 represent the type of building that we need to, that we need to be building for the kingdom of God. Yes. Building others up. Amen. Jesus, I will build my church um, in our Jerusalem, in our Judea and Samaria, and in our ends of the earth, what we need in the kingdom, we need building 429. Yeah. One dictionary uses a word that you may never have heard before. 
Have you ever heard the word elevator? With a D, de elevator. It's defined as the opposite of an elevator. A de elevator goes beneath the surface. Um, in the kingdom, in building 429, we don't need elevators. Amen. We need elevators. Amen. You are either an elevator or a elevator. Elevators drag people down. They pull them down beneath the surface. They lower their expectations. But elevators raise everyone around them. Elevators lift people. I want to just share with you uh, some, some uh, pictures and some statistics maybe about the city that we live in, uh, Buckeye, Arizona, in the Valley of the Sun, here in Maricopa County, um, and even we could think of our ends of the earth. If you didn't know it, if you've had your head under the sand and didn't realize it, for the last 19 years, this city has been growing exponentially. Um, there are now somewhere around, the, the last estimate was 68,000 people that called Buckeye their home, but that was the 2016 census. And building has started again, and it's, it's increasing and growing. Buckeye is regularly on the Forbes magazine top 15 fastest growing sur suburbs in the nation consistently since 2005. And not only that, but the county that you live in, Maricopa County, is the fastest growing county in the United States. So some of us, man, we just, we love that. Woohoo! yeah, exciting. You know, my wife gets excited when she sees Starbucks coming to town. I mean, my wife will go around and just begin to claim malls and she will just, I, I could just see a mall right there. Now some of us were not as excited about that. Uh, some of you say, oh man, I don't want the stuff that happens in city to happen in Buckeye. There's no going back. Not going to change. And that, that can of worms is open. I mean, that, that Pandora's box they talk about, it's, it's happened. And it's happening more and more. In our city, they're projecting now the population will be somewhere around 100,000 people by 2020. Now, I will confess to you, I, I'm a city guy. I love cities, always have. I have no problem with growth. It was actually part of what I felt in my spirit in the year 2005 when I came to be your pastor, that I want to be part of that. I'm excited as the city grows. I want it to grow in a healthy way. I want churches to get out ahead of the curve, and that we're going to need multiple, multiple churches that are preaching God's Word and growing the kingdom. Um, some of you don't like it, and I get it, and I understand where you're coming from. Um, I don't like the traffic. Oh, I hate the traffic. I don't like the, the rate of crime increasing. I don't like that either. My family has been hit in the most personal way by the rate of crime. Um, some of the things that are happening in our nation, in our city, and in our county, you are going to see a substantial rate of increase among ethnic communities. Hispanics, in most of Maricopa, Spanish is the first language in the home 26% of the time, but in our area of Buckeye, it is 29% of the time. I have a dream for us to provide an identical service in Spanish. That's why yo practicar mi español todos los días. And I'm getting there, okay? I didn't even say that right. I just said I too practice Spanish anyway. But, but I caught it. Okay, I caught it. And I'm believing that someday we're going to be able to minister in Spanish. And the Asian community is growing rapidly in our area, and the black community, my brothers and sisters, it is growing rapidly. Amen. Now some of you don't know this, but man, that makes me so happy. I was a basketball player in high school. My best friends are black. I mean, that's, 
I, that's, those are my buddies. And my two boys growing up, their best friends were black. Jove and I'd walk out of my bedroom and he'd be sitting there eating a bowl of cereal. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, eating cereal? <laughs> I'm just saying that our city is at a very important juncture. And if we're going to build the church of Jesus Christ, in the way that honors him, then it's going to require that we have elevators in Amen. building 429. Amen. There's basically two types of elevators. The first type is a grain elevator. In fact, it's our first point. Grain elevators raise competency. Interestingly, grain elevators typically are what you find in small towns. The grain elevator um, is, is a great icon of American farm life. If you have never looked at uh, YouTube videos about what a grain elevator is, I mean, what, that's kind of a funny way to why would you do that? But I'm encouraging you, you should go on YouTube and type in grain elevator and just look at how it works. What an amazing, amazing system. The grain elevator is about a system. If you don't know what it is, the, the grain elevator operates in such a way so that a, a big truck can pull into a, a, a covered area and open up the bin and, and the grain goes in and it falls onto a conveyor belt which takes it to the elevator. The elevator is more or less kind of a big huge dredging system that circles around like this and it just scoops up the grain or the corn or what have you and carries it all the way to the top and then there's an operator at the top of the elevator who decides which hole to feed it into and those pipes go to different silos so that you've got all of this grain stored in a powerful, uh, you know, just an easy way to pick up. And so that's how the farmer gets it there. He drops it off. The grain elevator takes it up. And then when it's time to deliver it, that way they've got it on site. And the trucks can drive in. And he says, I need a load of corn. And they go, well, we've got it in silo 15. And whoosh, they open up. They can fill up that truck. Man, it gets delivered. See, what I would like for you to understand is I'm thinking of grain in the way that Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. And, and we are, we're delivering the gospel around this unified vision. Have you, have you ever just thought to yourself, what would it look like if, if the church of Jesus Christ was a fine oil machine so that every believing follower of Christ was equipped and ready and just at their place of ministry, just delivering the gospel, whether it's local or worldwide, whether it's a, around the corner or around the globe. Did you know that um, in the United States we have 250,000 rivers? Did you know there were that many rivers? I mean, I thought there were a lot, but I thought, wow, 250,000, that's a lot of rivers. And some of them are amazing, like the big Mississippi. You can stand on one point, and it's an entire mile across to the other side. This massive, enormous river. The Missouri River is the longest river in the nation, and it just winds thousands of miles, I think 1,500 miles, I don't have that in my notes, but rivers are amazing. But here's something, here's something that you may not know. There's 250,000 rivers, but there are millions, millions of streams, creeks, tributaries, that feed into the rivers. And so, what I hear a lot in the circles I move in, people talk about church life, and, and uh, one of the things is, well, why is it, you know, that we, we celebrate, like, the big churches and not the little churches? I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I, I celebrate the Mississippi. Man, that thing is enormous. That's massive. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. But I also celebrate the tributaries. 
And I would never be one to discredit and say, well, we've got to have all mega churches because did you know that more than half of the churches in the United States are 50 people or less? I mean, we're talking about an enormous influence <clears throat> upon our culture. But what I am saying to you, it's fine to be a small church for a little while. But it is not okay to stay a, fine, a small church. Oh, Pastor Keith, what are you talking about? I like the size of our church right now. I know everybody by name. I, I can tell that person sitting in their seat. And, and if they're not there, I know them. And boy, it just feels like family. It feels wonderful. But the danger is we become content with who we are here. And so God never intended that. He doesn't want four walls and a, a group of Club 99 joining in here while that one is lost out there. He wants more and more people coming into his kingdom. So to that end, the second point this morning is about passenger elevators. Passenger elevators lift spirits. Passenger elevators are what you see in large towns. I don't think we're ever really, we've got a few of them here in town, but the vision for Buckeye is not to have skyscrapers and stuff like that. Uh, the average median age in Buckeye is 31.5, and the average person in Buckeye spends 35 minutes in their commute. We're a bedroom community. They refer to Buckeye as an expert. We drive to Phoenix, and. But I'm telling you, who knows what will happen. Did you know that there's places outside of Las Vegas where it also it already says future Interstate 11? And did you know that the prospects for Interstate 11 are that it will come down uh, through um, uh, Wickenburg and then come and connect to Sun Valley Parkway? The future is that that will be Interstate 11. For a moment, it will merge with I-10, and then it will go just south of us, what is now Highway State Route 85, they're projecting, will become Interstate 11. It will be the first, the first uh, intra-state, because it will connect Mexico all the way to Canada. Uh, it bypasses Phoenix. Sorry, Phoenix. <laughs> but it goes right through the heart of Buckeye. <laughs> so what does that mean? It means the church had better realize we have amazing opportunity. And so godly values in the midst of persecution. Passenger elevators, they manufacture, uh, manufactured in a way to carry a, a weight load. So you get on an elevator and you read that little certificate uh, inspected by uh, so-and-so, number 7351. You want to look at the date? Oh, good, they inspected it this last year, right? And, and then you look for that spot that says, this elevator weight capacity is 2,500 pounds. <coughs> Stephanie and I went to Italy. Uh, we went uh, on a, a little sightseeing tour. We stayed in some Airbnbs with uh, our son Nick, his wife Taylor, and uh, so it's, it's me and Steph and Nick and Taylor, and we were staying, and this was in Rome, it was beautiful, this, we were up on the eighth floor in this apartment, and uh, the owner, he, <clears throat> he says, when you use this elevator, it's designed for no more than four people, no more than four people, and I'm like, okay, okay, and he, he says, uh, you, you tiny small elevator, the four of us get in there, we each had our one suitcase and a backpack. That's what we, we did for this, this traveling. And so we get squeezed in there, and we're looking there, and Nick says, Huh, look at that. Weight load, 800 pounds. Oh. <laughs> and we're already going up. And we start looking around, and we start doing the math. <laughs> you know what I'm well, I think we're okay. How much does that bag weigh? <laughs> hey. Passenger elevators lift people and, and they lift spirits and they do so by our values. How did they act in Acts? Well, think about this. Um, there was one incident that really goes perfectly with um, uh, grain elevators raising competency. That's the first point. Because in Acts chapters 5 and then into 6, they the widows who were Hebrews had been neglected in the daily distribution of the food. 
the uh, the food pantry ministry had blossomed and and uh, the Greek widows were getting bread but the Hebrew widows were being neglected and, and somebody said oh, wait a minute this, this is right I mean after all we're the we're the ones that should be getting this and and um, and they called together the leaders of the church and they prayed and, and this is where this is where in uh, just Holy Spirit led wisdom Peter is the the voice of the early church says you guys elect leaders and these deacons they're going to serve the church Stephen was one of them and uh, they're going to take care of this and, and by the way there's Greek names those seven names of the earliest deacons we have some Greek names right in there and and he says we're going to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word and you guys are going to elect leaders and it sounded good to everybody and it worked out it, it was it may sound like a little thing but you just try to imagine that could have been a disaster. It could have been a disaster, but they avoided, they, they averted destruction, and, and they had this delivery system that worked. They were a good grain elevator. What about passenger elevator? How did they act in the book of Acts? Acts chapter 8, uh, the persecution of the church. So in chapter 7, you hear Stephen giving a speech, and what happens? They are so angry when he says Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, they pick up stones stones and they throw him at him. He gets stoned to death and as he lays there dying he looks up and he sees Jesus looking over the portals of heaven and, and his face is shining like an angel. And But you would think how horrible and it is. But what did it do? It forced the church out of its comfort zone. And as the church is persecuted and as they're going they are evangelizing and preaching and signs and wonders and miracles are happening and they they valued something godly. Um, I was praying this last week. I, I had probably the strangest prayer time. I was so, so sincere in this. And it, it went a direction that I, I never imagined it going. And it was this. I was praying to God and I said, I would hope that I would choose you over everybody else. Even before my own wife, I don't envision it ever coming to that. But if Stephanie ever said, turn away from God, what has He done for us? I would hope my loyalty would be to you first. I would hope that I would be loyal to you if my own children said, I'm not going to serve God. They're serving God. I thank God for that. I can't imagine them not serving Him. But I would hope my loyalty that you are first, God. If, if, if others fade away, if, even if my church, if they disowned you and, and said, I'm turning my back. We're going the way that other churches have gone. and We're going to just be more casual on this truth thing. Yes. I would hope my loyalty would be to you Praise before God. all others. Praise God. I even prophesied some things over my unborn grandchildren. <laughs> Glory to God. Um, Glory to God. Here's what I know. Often our values are defined, follow this, by sexual practice. Because no other thing is more vitally connected to our essence than whether we value God's word about sexual practice or our own preference. This has to do with several areas that are hot button issues in our nation right now. It touches on the issue of abortion. I'm so sad, so sickened in my heart by some of the legislation that has taken place in our nation. Now, um, performing abortions right up to the very moment before delivery. And even in the most barbaric tones, a mother being assured, if you wanted to have an abortion but it failed, don't worry, we'll keep the baby comfortable until that point and then we guarantee to take its life. That's a barbaric way of approaching life. But all areas of sexuality, homosexuality, pedophilia, <clears throat> adultery, fornication, 
Fornication is a King James word, the king language, ancient word that just simply means having sexual relations outside of marriage. I'm going to suggest to you that your views about these practices are directly connected to the people you care most about. But you must know that this is a dangerous approach. Your views must be guided and established by the Bible, yes. not, yes. not by the people you care the most about. Now, that's right where the rubber meets the road. That's that kind of language like, I would hope my loyalty will be with you before all others. Yes. But here's the amazing thing. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it lists uh, people who are now part of the church mm -hmm. in Corinth. Mm -hmm. And it gives a, a litany list of different ones. Uh, adulterers. Um, people who have violated law. It says homosexual offenders. It names several different areas. And it says to these Christian saints in Corinth, such were some of you. Past tense. Such were some of you. See, I believe that what happens in modern America is that, that we're a little iffy about, well, I'm not sure, does the Bible say this? Does the Bible mean that? No, the Bible is very clear. Yeah. Yeah. I was glad to hear that the United Methodist Church in their national yeah. convention this last week said, we will not ordain homosexuals. Yeah. Yeah. But the very fact that it's even being voted on what, how does that even come up? Because it is not, it's not a question mark in the Bible. But here's the thing. As a Christian, and this is my view, and you might differ from me, and I, I welcome other input, but um, let's take one of those areas. By the way, adultery is wrong. Yes, right. and we, we preach against homosexuality. We preach against pedophilia. We seem to not sometimes say, you know what? Adultery is wrong. Amen. And God will not tolerate when we violate his, his laws. Right. So, um, but in this one area, homosexuality, what often happens is that Christians either do one of two things. One, they hide for fear that they're going to offend someone. Or two, they go to the opposite extreme and they become a Bible-thumping, mean, bigoted, angry person. Right. And all it takes is one time for someone in that kind of a spirit to hold a poster that says, God hates homosexuals. To threaten to blow up an abortion clinic. All it takes is one time. And someone who is struggling... With very real struggles, they will write it off and say, see, that's God's church. But if they see a genuine Christian who says, I want to be very clear, I disagree with your view on this, but let's walk together. Can we talk through this? Could I pray with you? Could, could we believe for God to do a work in your life? I'm believing that Buckeye First Assembly will have many, but such were some of you in it. And I am praying that God will give us wisdom and grace to always stand for truth, but to do so in love. So to elevate means to tell people they're sinners. But they already know they're sinners. They don't need to be told that. They know. Right. They do. To elevate is motivated by hatred. But to elevate says, let me walk through this with you. Yeah. You have some serious life problems. I love you enough to talk about it. Amen. And it's motivated by love. Here's the saying, to disintegrate, delevate, but to be great, elevate. You say that again, to disintegrate, delevate, but to be great, elevate. Here's the finisher, your cool down. This is your stretch at Planet Witness. Your elevator needs to be surfaced regularly. 
When you get in an elevator, don't you look at the certificate and, and you think, is this recent? Oh, oh my goodness, this one wasn't checked for the last decade. Are you going to ride that elevator? No, you're not going to ride that elevator. But when you see, oh, they just inspected it. It looks like it's got a clean bill of health. You feel a little more secure to ride on up on the elevator. You and I, our, you know, our ministry is to elevate. But the only, way the, the only way the elevator works is for it to be continually inspected. And so what we have to do is some soul sifting. And we do it regularly. Today, I want to encourage you to do some soul sifting. I was amazed when I was um, looking at um, a job description for elevator uh, repairmen, servicemen. By the way, you can earn like 70000 a year if you want to be an elevator, um, <laughs> elevator inspector. <laughs> so, some of you just felt the call of God. Didn't you? But, I mean, do you really want, do you really want that weight? <laughs> What if something goes wrong? But no, no, I was reading through job description for an elevator. And by the way, I'm not looking for a job. I was just researching. I mean, there's not a lot of skills for a piano playing guy that can do PowerPoints, okay? I mean, out there. You know, I might be able to work at Circle K and that would be awesome. Um, but the elevator. So it said in this job description, must be able to oil and squeak and do the tensioner and blah, blah, blah. And then it said, and must be able to sift. And I never could figure out to sift, to sift what for the elevator? I don't even know. Some of you will have to enlighten me. But I did think, that's us. We're elevators and we've got to sift through all the stuff continually getting rid of the debris. Uh, on some level, when you sift something, it's when a screen comes up and removes the impurities and they can be taken away. And that's the only way we can elevate is if we're filled with love and all of the hatefulness is gone. So in order to do soul sifting, here's what it involves. See, the soul is defined as the intellect, the emotions, and the will. Amen. That's the biblical definition of soul. Soul searching. The, the Hebrew word nefesh, it means intellect, um, emotions, and will. Your soul, your nephesh, is the intersection of what you know, what you feel, and what you will choose. You have just defined your soul. What do you know? What are you feeling about it? What do you choose? That defines the soul. So you... You're just like Abraham in the Old Testament staring into the nighttime stars and God said, I'm going to give you so many stars that you can't even count them. And, and, and you're like Abraham said, God, I, I don't even have a, just one sun. Stars? I don't even have, I just want a star. I don't have, can't I use my, my uh, wife, she gave me her handmaid. Can't we do it this way? And God said, no, no, no. It's all about promise. It's all about faith. It's all about believing. And you're going to have more descendants than the stars in the heaven. All you need is hope. You need new hope. And once you are filled with hope, you will believe, you will have faith, and then you will go and light your world. I want to um, ask a special favor um, and by the way, I appreciate Leah being on the computer this morning, and I think she's got this. Pete, you're right there too if, if, if she needs any assistance. We showed a video to start the service, a little countdown video, and it was um, a couple of minutes long, and it's, it's about desert places and about, about following God and crying out to God from our desert. I'm going to ask you guys to get that ready in just a moment. Can you play that again? And while that video is playing, Pastor Mo, if you guys, if you can come and the worship team come back and just lead us as after this after this video as you as you see fit. I want to just pray with anyone that that wants to have some sifting. If you if you just need like me, if you're like me, boy, you can you can relate. I just I need for God to sift out any debris out of out of my life and just get it get rid of it so that I can elevate people. Here's, here's what that looks like. God will be so 
specific to you. He, he'll lead you in your prayer time. He'll show you things that you need to pray. He'll say something to you that he might not say to somebody else. God will take his word and he, he does this with it. He gives different meanings, different applications to all of us. For some of us, it's going to look like this. Father, forgive me. I have been so mean-spirited towards my wife. We have been talking mean to her. She didn't deserve that. Really, what's going on? I'm afraid. There's a lot of fear in me, and I just confess that. I don't want to be that kind of mean-spirited person. Would you sift that out of me? For some of you, it might look like this. Father, I confess that I've been taking my vehicle and I've been using it as if it's a 7,000 pound weapon. I've been cutting people off and I've, I've been so furious. I've, I have road rage and I pound on the horn and I wave at people and I yell. And, and I, I want you to know I'm really sorry for that. I don't even know how I did. I don't know why I'm in such a hurry to go there. I need you to help me in this area. Because really what's going on is I'm headed there fast, but I have no idea where I'm going. I'm, I'm not patient enough to just wait. So, so forgive me. For, for some of you, for some of you right now, the Lord just spoke this to my heart. For some of you, your prayer is, God, help me, because I started using that medication that the doctor gave me. And I didn't do anything wrong because it was for the pain, but now the pain is gone, but I still, something keeps hurting inside, and I keep using that medicine. I'm, I'm realizing that now I'm medicating myself to cover up pain. Lord. What's really going on, I'm hurting in here. I need you to deliver me. I need you to make me free. Amen. See, the Holy Spirit will take this message and apply it to your heart. I, I so want us to be healthy elevators. I so want that. I don't want to, to be known as a, a church where that we're sharp edges and that we bristle against people. But I just want to be that church that stands for truth but does so in a way that we lift people with us. We lift our city to the throne. And uh, So if, if you'd like prayer, for your elevator inspection this morning. I'm just going to be down here at the front after the video and as the worship team is leading us, I'd love to anoint you with oil and just pray with you and have some time with you. Would you guys go ahead and roll that video? Also, just want to ask the help of prayer team. 
members, if you're part of the prayer team, can you just come and, and help me to be available to pray? I sense that there's going to be several people that want prayer this morning. The Lord bless all of you. Have a wonderful day. Breathe me in, saith the Lord. Are your hearts heavy? Breathe me in, saith the Lord. Fill yourselves with me and the spirit that I have given you for the comfort and the strength of all those things to come. Selah, think of it, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.